Hey guys, you're watching Dansky, the place to be to develop your creative skills. And in this video, we're gonna be doing a walkthrough of my new piece of photo art titled Survivor. Now, this is something that I did very recently. If you've not seen the speed art, that version is under three minutes long. You can check it out on a card up there. This is the longer 60 minute version where I'm gonna go through the entire process at a slightly faster pace, but I'm going to narrate over the top of the footage what I'm doing at any given time. And there's a few different tricks and techniques that I will touch on in the video that if you'd like more of an explanation, I've actually done some tutorials on these things in the past. So as we go through the video, I'll link any relevant tutorials up there as well on a card. But anyway, that's enough from me. We'll jump to the screen and get started. Rightio, so I'm off. I'm working on a canvas size of 3840 by 2160, which is 4K. As I said in my previous video, it makes a nice wallpaper size. So I'm just adding in the background. This is a warehouse. It's a smart object as well, which means that I can add things like smart filters to it, make lots of changes, but I still get a lot of flexibility over those smart filters. So I can turn them off, turn them back on, or just remove them altogether. And you can see here, I'm just angling the, the entire scene as well. This is something that I decided very early on, I put together like a 15 minute concept, which is something I do at the beginning before I do all of these, just to see if the idea actually has any legs. You can check it out on Twitter. It was very, very rough and it looked terrible, but yeah, it looked good enough that it said to me that there was an idea here that we could explore further. So at the moment you can just see me brushing around the edge. What I decided quite early on was that I was going to keep part of the warehouse, remove a large portion of the ceiling, and then just completely blow out that right side. So I'm gonna replace that with like a, like a ruined city. So what I've done is added a layer mask to the warehouse, and I'm just using one of Photoshop's soft, round, pressure opacity brushes. Very, very long name. Uh, but I've definitely done a tutorial on masking before, so if you've not checked that out, what I'll do is I will link that on a card at the top of the screen. So you can see I've just been using the very small brush just to go around the edges and the detail. I like using like a soft brush with a hardness of 0% because you get like a, like a nice softness to the edge of everything you kind of cut around in Photoshop. Whereas if you use like a really hard edge brush or a pencil, for example, you get that like unnaturally hard edge. So I like a little bit of softness. It just helps everything blend together a bit more seamlessly. So small brush for the edges, larger brush for these big areas. And here I've just used, I think it was like the quick selection tool, which is really good for selecting certain areas. And it just makes it much easier and you can see here it looks pretty rough as well but this is like a like a war-torn city that i'm creating here so that kind of like roughness doesn't really matter i don't need to kind of get a perfect pen tool cut out here so this is the ruined city that i was talking about the uh, the images here are from adobe stock as are all of the images that i'm using and i'm just brushing around the warehouse image even more now and just trying to essentially roughen this up a little bit and integrate it with the, the rubble of the city behind. So this is one of the great things uh, about using your hand for this is that, you know, when you're, when you're kind of drawing or using your hand to cut something out or using a graphics tablet even, your hand is, is gonna occasionally be quite imprecise. So that works to our advantage here. We don't need this to be perfectly straight. And if you can, you know, mask all this out and just kind of jitter your hand at the same time, just give yourself a little bit of a twitch. It actually makes it look better, a bit more realistic. Whereas if I cut this out perfectly smoothly, it would just, well, it would just look a bit terrible, really. So you can see I'm trying to actually cut around certain objects. This didn't quite work here, so I undid that. But I'm cutting around certain objects in the background just to try and make things look like they actually fit together rather than making it look like I've got the rubble as a separate two dimensional image in the back and then the foreground with the floor and everything in front. So here we go, I just used the select and select subject feature in Photoshop. This is something they added a little while back and it's just amazing. Like it doesn't always create a perfectly clean cutout, but for something like this, like I say, where there's gonna be a lot of rough edges, it makes it pretty quick and easy for me to cut a subject out. And you can see here I'm using the 
edit and puppet warp tool just to kind of bend and adjust her position. I think I actually left that out in the end, but it's always worth it just to try and match your subject a little bit more with the scene. If you can bend an arm here or a leg there just to get them to fit a little bit better with the scene, then, you know, go for it. Just don't push it too far so you completely distort them out of shape. So what I did was I made the subject that I'd cut out a smart object and then what I can do is double click that thumbnail of the smart object in my layers panel, go inside it, you can see here it's opened up a separate tab. And what I can do now is I can continue working on this, refining this mask. This is all kept inside of the smart object. So think of smart objects as like, like a document within a document. Yes, it will uh, require a more powerful computer to keep creating smart objects. Yes, it will make your file size and your file saving larger and longer, but you know, they just give you much more flexibility. And uh, yeah, it's a great way to like organize your layers a bit better as well. You know, you can have hundreds of layers in a document, but if you package some of those layers inside smart objects, it just keeps your main document just a little bit cleaner. So I'm doing a lot of work on the subject here, just cutting around some of the arms. It didn't quite get a perfect cut out. I removed a piece of arm there. So I'm just gonna smooth that in again, using that same soft, round, feathered, whatever it's called, brush tool. Just brushing around all this and removing some of these coils and bits and pieces, just brushing back in. So just checking that I haven't actually removed anything by mistake. And the great thing about using masks rather than something that's more destructive like the eraser tool is that you can turn the mask on and off. You can add into it, you can remove from it. With the eraser tool, you know, once you've erased something, it's permanent. The only way out of it is to just go edit, undo, 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 and then you lose all of your progress. So if you get a chance to learn masks, then they're definitely worth learning. Now you can see a bright background as well. I haven't really talked about that. We've got the bright red. When I'm cutting a subject out, I like to throw a very contrasting background behind, something very vibrant so I can actually see how my cutout is looking. It's just a bit easier to see rather than looking at the whole kind of transparency checkerboard effect behind. So now we're throwing in the, uh, <laughs> the robots, the mechs and you can use the select color range feature to easily select white. That's what I did just then. It makes selecting the background, which is all white, very easily. And then I can just inverse that selection. And then it just enables me to take that mech off the white background really easily. This one was a bit trickier because it's on black and the mech is quite dark. But again, I think I did select subject there and it does a pretty good job of determining what the subject is in a photo, even if like this, it's not human. And I'm pretty sure actually I've cut out a, like a cat with it before as well. So, you know, select subject. Um, the subject can be quite a few different things. It doesn't have to be a humanoid. Okay, so we've got some fire and some smoke. That's going to go in the background somewhere. I think I actually end up removing this. This is what happens in this kind of process, at least for me. It's very much not a straight line. It's a wibbly wobbly line. The process is never straightforward. Sometimes I'll go through and just, you know, completely compile the entire scene, then go back and refine it. Sometimes I'll refine it as I go. It just, I guess it just depends how I feel, what kind of mood I'm in. So I'm adding some, uh, some light rays here. So you'll see this later on in the video as well. It's very important to kind of understand where your light source is in the video, or at least decide where your light source is, because that's going to affect where you need to add highlights and shadows, things like that, to all of the different objects in your scene. Because remember, these images are more than likely, they've all been shot under different lighting conditions. So if you have your light coming from the right-hand side on your subject, and then the mech has it coming from the left, well, that's not really going to make sense. Unless you've got like multiple lights in the scene, it's going to be a bit strange. So try and orient the subjects and objects in your scene so the light matches. But if it doesn't, then you can definitely kind of, you, you can work with that. It just makes it a lot more challenging. But you'll see later on that I'm going to work to really add shadows and highlights to the subject, to the mechs, to everything really, just to make the whole scene feel a little bit more believable. 
And this is the way that I typically structure all of my composites. I usually have a scene folder, I have a subject, or in this case, survivor folder. This is usually the focal character of my work. And then I'll sometimes have an extra folder that's called like objects or things that are in the scene. And then at the very top, I have post effects. Now post effects is just like all the lighting, fog, color adjustment layers. Essentially, that's the folder that's like the magic folder. You can turn it off and back on and it can take something that looks average and make it look awesome. So it's quite fun. You'll probably see me do this later on. It's quite fun to just flick that, that folder on and off at the end. Now you can see here what I'm doing is I'm actually drawing in shadow. So the light is coming from the upper right side of the screen. So I'm trying to think, okay, how is that going to cast a shadow underneath my subject? So any areas of the subject that are really, really close to the floor. So like we have like the toes on her feet or her hands, those are gonna have a shadow, but the shadow is gonna be a little bit harder around those areas. Areas like the body and the head, because there's more distance between those parts of the subject in the floor, the shadow is gonna be softer, so a little bit more blurred. So what I'm doing now is I'm just masking some of these areas out to try and make shadows harder in certain places and a bit softer in other places. And I've added a Gaussian blur filter as well and you can adjust the opacity. And now what I'm doing is I think I'm adding, yeah, so there we go, I'm adding a, a burn adjustment layer. So essentially something that's gonna help me adjust the shadows, dodge for the highlights. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this and it's worth learning a few different techniques because some techniques give a slightly better end result than others do, depending on what you're trying to do. So you can see here, because the light's coming from the upper right Part of the screen I'm burning in some shadows there into the left in fact generally with the shadows in this entire thing I think I probably could have done a better job with the shadows you'll see some more shadows later as I introduce more characters and for the mechs as well but I think all of the shadows if there's one thing I could go back and change it probably would have been spending a bit more time on the shadows And that's kind of like a general theme with these as well. It's like spending a lot more time on the little details. It just means you're gonna get a better end result. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I've just created a new layer. I've just picked a color. This again is quite sloppy, but it works for this. I've just picked a color similar to the skin, gone a little bit darker than that color, and then just brushed over that highlight on the left arm because that was causing a little bit of a problem. There are quite a few different ways you can get around things like that. That was me doing it the lazy way. And you can see here, I've, I've just made a selection of the mech, compressed it as well. That again is a very lazy way to do a shadow. I think hopefully I kind of got away with it in this one. But um, yeah, typically what you wanna do is try and imagine where the light source is and then how that would cast a shadow over certain elements which is quite difficult actually, because essentially these are lots of uh, two dimensional images, but you try and ha you have to try and imagine that this is a, a real kind of scene with depth. And if the light source is directly above all the subjects, how is that gonna translate to the floor? I mean, I guess a really good way to practice this is actually if you have like a dark room and a torch, what you can do is hold out different objects um, maybe you have like a, maybe you or your child has like a toy robot that you could actually use and then you shine the light above the robot to the side of the robot and watch how the shadow actually changes depending on the angle of the light. Or you could bring the torch closer to the, to the toy or the subject, move it away. That's probably a really good way actually to kind of get a better understanding of how light works, how the whole hardness, softness thing works that I was talking about a moment ago. So here I'm just using the select and mask feature to kind of remove that fringing around the edge of the subject. And I've definitely done a tutorial on this, so I'm gonna link that at the top of the screen. It's a really nifty little tick. Tick, 
it's a nifty little trick if you've got something that you've already cut out and you just want to remove that white highlight, that fringing from the edge, you can do it very quickly and easily. Okay, so we're doing some, uh, some burn and dodge shadows and highlights again. Now for the mech, and I'm gonna go through and do this for everything in the scene. So that the lighting on every character or every object in the scene all matches up super important and actually it's worth just pointing out that the scene at the very bottom is still a smart object that's something i did at the very beginning i like to make a lot of my main images so like my scene my character a smart object because then like this i can double click the scene it loads as a separate tab and what i can do is i can start to build out that scene in like that sub document inside that smart object and you might be thinking well why would you do this well it makes it a lot easier to manage your layers in two different places so i can build the entire scene out in here and then in the main document it just shows as one layer so it's a lot cleaner but also i'm building out my entire scene this robot here is very far away the one that i started on is a lot closer there's lots of elements in my scene that are going to be further away and some of it closer. So what this enables me to do is build out the scene inside this smart object. And then if I go back to the main document, you'll see this later on, I can apply a particular type of blur effect to the smart object and then everything in my scene will be blurred appropriately. Whereas if I built this all in the main document, I'd like I'd blur my scene. Then I'd have to go and blur each mech individually. Then I'd have to go and blur the shadows. You have to go through and manually blur every element. Whereas if you just create the scene inside of a smart object, just apply the, the blur that we're gonna be doing later to the smart object, everything in your scene will blur accordingly. So I think in this one, I think I may have used tilt shift, hopefully. We'll see that a bit later on, which is a blurring technique that enables you to kind of blur things as they go further into the distance, which is really, really cool. I can't quite remember, but I'm sure we'll see in a moment. So again, we're doing the whole dodge and burn shadows and highlights for this second robot, this mech here. Here we go, blur gallery, tilt, shift. Now this requires quite a powerful computer. So what I like to do is uncheck preview and just get everything right. Otherwise, every time you move anything, adjust anything, it will try and reload that preview, uh, which on lower end hardware can take quite a while, but it's an incredibly awesome feature. So you can set the focus point and then the kind of graduation of the blur. So I want my subject to really be the focus here and I need the floor kind of around my subject to be in focus as well. And as we move further away from the subject into the distance where we have the chopper and the rubble and the mechs as well, I want this to blur out. Now I'm doing this with just one, uh, one tilt shift. You can actually apply multiple tilt shifts, which is probably a better way of doing it if you've got lots of different things moving towards the distance or away away from the distance or towards the distance however you want to word it and i'm bringing the blur amount quite low down as well i don't want it to be too dramatic i'm trying to kind of really replicate the depth of field that you would get if this was shot on a camera so i'm going to click ok there we go and you can see because it's a smart object of course it adds this blur gallery this tilt shift as a smart filter and i can turn that on off i can edit it i can delete it so it gives me that flexibility so this is another technique that you can use to add shadows in places i've just added a black color fill adjustment layer set the blending mode to multiply and just brushing in a few more shadows And then I've made that a dark brown instead of just black. So it introduces a little bit of color. So the dark brown is like a, like the same tone as the skin, but just like a darker version. Whereas if you just kind of use 
If you use just straight black, like 000000, zero, 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 zero on like organic skin tones, it, uh, it doesn't always work. So just introduce like a little bit of color, a bit of red, a bit of pink into that. And uh, it, will, uh, it will blend a lot better. Obviously depends on the, the skin color of your subject as well. So here I'm adding a lens flare light. I've definitely done a tutorial on how that you can do this really easily as well. So I'm gonna link that on a card at the top of the screen now. I do this in a lot of my tutorials actually. It's just a great way to make a light really dramatic. So the mech in the background actually has a light already as part of the image. This one didn't, so I'm adding that in manually. I mean, if one mech's gonna look evil, then the other one's gotta look like evil and sinister as well, right? Okay, so you can see it coming together now. You can see it all coming together. And you can also see that I've named all of my layers, which is definitely a good thing to do because sometimes these composites can get incredibly complicated. And when you're trying to find that specific one layer that you need to find or something that just looks a bit off, at least you have everything named. So it, it makes things a lot easier. Whereas if you've got like a hundred different layer one, layer two, layer three, it's, uh, it's gonna be a nightmare, trust me. So now I'm adding uh, an image, which is like some dust, some particles. Just blending that in a little bit. So trying to kind of match the environment. This is like, this is a pretty hectic kind of war zone at the moment. This person is kind of essentially one of the last few survivors. So this just kind of adds to that drama. I'm just brushing out some of the, uh, or cloning out rather, some of the, um, the larger parts of dust that looked a bit rubbish. So I wanted to kind of keep it to smaller particles and more specifically around the kind of upper part of the image. So the sky, things like that. And then we're going and adding a few more adjustment layers. So the color lookup ones are really, really good. You can like turn day into night, night into day, that sort of thing. But you can also use color balance. Color balance is a great adjustment layer if you're looking to blend different images together that have been shot under different lighting conditions with different like tones and all sorts. So you can actually adjust the shadows, midtones, and highlights and all of the different colors within those ranges. So color balance adjustment layer is a must. Okay, so I'm adding another lens flare. Oh, okay, we're going a bit a bit more dramatic. So the other lens flare <laughs> clearly wasn't good enough. So what I'm gonna do is use something like this. It's a little bit more pronounced and I'm gonna clip that, that red. Oh wow, that is very dramatic. That is a little bit OP, I think. We need to, we need to tone that down. There we go, we're gonna do the same one for Mech 2. So even though Mech 2 already has a little light, a little light of Sinister Evil, we're going to add another one, because why not? And you can see, because we've applied that tilt shift blur as well to the entire scene, when I jump back to the main document, you'll see it hopefully more in a moment. You'll be able to see that those mechs, those lights, lens flares, they all blur appropriately and the background as well. So I think I'm just taking a moment now to just reflect on what I've done. Maybe, maybe grab a cup of tea and a biscuit. And we're just looking for a few other images here. I'm not entirely sure what I'm looking for. Oh, there we go. Fog. Of course. How did I not guess? Fog. So because this is on a black background, we can very easily blend particles, fog, smoke, lighting, things like that. If it's on a black background, just select lighten, screen, those kinds of blending modes, and you can easily blend those into the background. It removes the black or the dark colors, keeps the lighter colors. It's brilliant, and I know I've definitely done a tutorial on that, so I'm gonna link that on a card at the top of the screen as well.
I've also got a fog brush as well. I think this is uh, from Envato Elements. There's a fantastic pack of fog brushes. And I believe this is one of them. Just a new layer, pick your foreground color. In this case, white, single left click, boom. You've got some fog. So by the looks of it, I'm being a bit greedy and having uh, two different types of fog, brush fog and image fog. And here you can see me using the color balance adjustment layer again. So it's fantastic. You can make images warmer, you can make them cooler, you can make them completely green if you want. And again, we're using some more Envato Elements brushes just to add some distressed texture to the, to the mechs. They were looking a little bit too clean before and considering this is a like a dusty, hectic, chaotic war zone, I felt they just needed a little bit of um, a little bit of dirt, a bit of whatever it is. You could add some rust as well, but just some texture. So I just added that on a separate layer and then you can use the blending modes just to blend those textures in. So again, we've got another Envato Elements texture. This one is broken glass. There's an entire pack for this. I don't think this was the best thing that I did, but um, at one point I just thought, yeah, we're gonna add some broken glass. So I added this as white, and then you can select bevel emboss in the blending options. And then you can just add some highlights and shadows to that. Blend it in to the floor a little bit. To access the blending options, just right click any layer select blending options and there you go now i'm just changing the color so this glass is transparent so of course you would see the floor through it and the floor is this kind of yellowy color so that's probably not the best thing added to the scene but again it, you know it's all about the small details if you add little details like that like some shattered glass on the floor it's something that no one would probably consciously notice in fact i can kind of forget it's even there but it definitely adds up to making a much more effective end result. Lots of little things do definitely combine together to make a better piece of work at the end. So we're adding, uh, we're adding Evil Sinister Cyborg Dog now. So again, the dog is also a smart object. So I can go in, make changes to the dog, save the smart object, come back out. And that dog is just one single layer in my main document or my scene. So remember we're adding things like the dog and you'll see some other soldiers, they get added in a moment as well. They're being added to the, the scene smart object so that they are affected by the whole tilt shift blur appropriately. So we've got soldier versus dog. So it's just about getting those all correct. And again, color balance, remember that's fantastic for blending the colors a bit more seamlessly. Or we can use hue and saturation. So there we go, just taking out a little bit of that green, putting them more into this kind of uh, yellowish, desert, dusty environment. Obviously it's not a desert, but it's just uh, Jungle green doesn't really doesn't really fit this scene. Urban, urban armor. We'll go with that, like some sort of urban des desert camo. And I've just made the dog a bit darker as well. We've got another soldier here who's looking for his sandwich that he packed into his backpack. And we're gonna pop him over on the right. He doesn't look like he has a real sense of urgency. He literally looks like he's trying to find his lunch, but uh, fortunately he's very small and probably the least prominently featured soldier in the entire thing. So I think I probably got away with that. So I'm just using the magic wand tool here this to select all of the white. That's the great thing about having subjects on white or plain black backgrounds sometimes is they make them, makes them very easy to cut out. And the lighting is normally quite good as well. Very sort of uh, neutral and you can kind of really work with that. Unfortunately, this guy doesn't seem to be, well, he took a little bit too much of the spotlight from my subject and uh, he's not really shooting at anything. So he very quickly got removed from the piece. 
And again, we're just adding shadows to this guy. Then we need some more shadows for him as well. So again, it all comes back to deciding where that light source is. And then just adding shadows and highlights to everything in your scene accordingly. So just going through, removing all the white. So you can use a lot of the selection tools, but sometimes I just like to go around and manually manually brush it myself. I can decide exactly which bits I want to be kind of kept in, which bits I like to remove. And I'm using like a, a graphics tablet, like a Wacom. Uh, I definitely recommend one because it just, it feels much more natural using a pen or a tablet stylus, or whatever you call it. Um, but also you can control things like pen pressure so yes, you can create this kind of artwork with a mouse or a trackpad, but it's so much easier and you get a much better result if you have a tablet because you can press a lot lightly or press more and it will make your lines thicker or thinner. So here we're just drawing back in part of the gun, the trigger guard that got removed. So sometimes the whole select subject thing doesn't grab it perfectly, but it gives you a good head start. So unfortunately for this poor chap, well, he, he did have bullets in his gun, but now what I'm doing is I'm actually redrawing part of the gun and then just extending this kind of barrel tip and very uh, lazily redrawing it. So he's actually run out of ammo. So when you have a gun or a firearm, when you fire your last bullet, the slide will, in most cases on most weapons, it will lock back. So this poor chap, unfortunately, is going up against Cyberdog and he's got no bullets left. Now this is a pretty uh, low quality retouch. You can see I've just duplicated the barrel. I would spend a lot more time on this if it was featured prominently, but because it's a very small part of the scene and then it's gonna have that tilt shift blur applied to it, you're not gonna be able to see it. You're really not. So it's just kind of about thinking, okay, do I need to spend ages making this look awesome? No, because nobody's ever going to see it. Like, yes, the, the small details are important, but this kind of detail that no one will ever notice, including myself, it's just, it's not worth spending the time on. And you can see it's very hard to even see that that, is, that has been very speedily, hastily, lazily retouched by me. So what I'm doing here is duplicating the soldier layer and setting one version to multiply and then just masking that multiply version in across the bottom. Multiply will keep the dark areas of an image and remove the lighter areas such as white. So that's a great way to quickly remove white from the bottom of these soldiers but also give them like a, like a slightly yellowish orangey tint which is probably what they would get coming off from the ground. Sorry dude, took away your bullets. You're gonna have to deal with Cyberdog on your own. And I think at this point, they were just a little bit too close to the foreground and the subject. I wanted them a bit less prominent in the background with a bit more blur. So I'm actually just making them smaller and moving them further away. And again, very, very lazily drawing shadows. This, this is probably the, the biggest shadow offender, this one here. No, oh, I suppose it's not too bad. <laughs> it could be worse. Like I said earlier, if there's one thing I could go back and redo, it'd be spending a bit more time on the shadows. So when you come to do yours, definitely spend more time on the shadows. Because if they look terrible, it's one of those things that I think will stand out. But at least I'm keeping all my layers organized. I've got my soldiers and my mechs all, my mechs all in their own folder. So, you know, like I, sh I should get some points for that, I think. So just adding a bit more shadowing under the soldier. And now we've got to go and add some shadowing to the dog. 
just trying to find a more effective way to make him darker at the moment. So I'm using a color fill adjustment layer and a levels adjustment layer and I've clipped this to the dog smart object layer. And this is a really good way that you can actually turn things that are white to black and sometimes vice versa as well. And I'm just brushing in some of those highlights. <laughs> this shadow starts off quite terrible, but it does, um, it does get marginally better later on in the video. I think there's definitely more scope to work on my shadows. <laughs> Oh goodness, that is awful. Wow, I hope this does improve or it's, it's not going to reflect very well on me. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously way too thick, but I, I think I do make it thinner in the end, if I remember correctly. So you can see the scene starting to come together. We've got lots of adjustment layers and apparently I'm going to add some more. This post effects folder does sometimes stack up with duplicates of adjustment layers and different things here and there, but you know, it's always good to try and keep your, your layers organized and as clean as possible. But if this is your own piece of artwork and you want to stack up like 20 different adjustment layers, some of which are the same, just go for it. It doesn't matter as long as you get the end result you're looking for. That's the important thing. So of course Cyborg Dog also gets evil sinister robot eye because obviously he does. I think the problem here that you'll see in a moment with adding this to the scene is that the, the robot dog's eye actually gets blurred out a little bit too much. So what I end up doing is taking the eye from this and bringing it into the main scene just so it doesn't get affected by that tilt shift blur. Okay, so we have burning building. Apparently this scene isn't dramatic enough, so I'm going to add some more. I'm just using edit and free transform to distort this out. You can press command or control and click on any of the corner points and you can distort images out of shape. So I can use that technique to match the perspective of this image to the perspective of the warehouse and the way you can see that kind of getting smaller as it goes into the distance. And now I've just added a layer mask and I'm just brushing around. So only this area is going to be affected by fire and I can pick a blending mode to try and blend that into the background. So you can see it looks acceptable there, I guess you could say. I probably could spend a bit more time on it, but once you save that and jump back to the main document with all the kind of crazy color effects over the top, the blur, you know, it's something that you just you do get away with. It looks fine. Now what I'm going to do is just pick like an orangey yellow color. I've set the blending mode to overlay. Soft light's also a really good one. Overlay's a bit more pronounced and areas I brush over like the mech and the scene, they're all going to have this orange tint. So it's kind of like a light coming off of these flames. So if you have lens flares and colors and light sources, besides your main one that might be like a sun or a light, it's also worth thinking about how these lights are going to cast their light on other objects in your scene. If you have a bright blue lamp, for example, what is near that blue lamp that is going to get affected? So you might want to add a blue glow to something that's nearby, for example. So here I'm just adding some smoke into the distance and just trying to brush around that. And again, you can see I'm using layer masks. In fact, once you use the layer masks, you will very rarely likely be using the eraser tool because masks are just, there's, there's no reason to use it really. Masks are just better. Trying to find a place for this weird chimney fire thing, didn't find it. So I think it goes in the end. We just go with black smoke. 
And now I'm just changing the color of the smoke just to give it that kind of slight kind of orangey yellowy tint to it. Really, really subtle. Just so it blends with the scene a bit more. Ooh, I think this is a failed experiment. So I was trying to create some sort of explosion coming out of the gun. <laughs> this clearly didn't work. It could have worked, but you've got that big like white highlight around the edge. It, uh, no, it, this didn't work. But I think I did find a way to use it in the end. This is actually like a mini gun. So I made it really small and just copy and pasted it all the way around the edge. So it's like all, you know, all of the barrels of the minigun are firing, which kind of looks quite cool. It sort of worked. And now I'm distorting each one out of shape just so they're not complete copy and paste jobs. It's a small detail, but you know, well, it's one that no one will probably notice actually, but I noticed and now you know. So um, it was definitely worth it. more uh, shadowing going in under the mech there. Dramatic fog and sand effects. It was a little bit distracting with those, so I kind of do turn them off sometimes. Noise. Oh, I always like to add a noise layer to a lot of my work. In fact, I do this with most things, even my YouTube thumbnails. I just add some noise, filter, noise, add noise, and then just set it to like overlay or soft light, bring the opacity down to like 10% or 5%, something like that. And rather than have your image look perfectly clean, you just add a little bit of noise. The noise that you'd kind of get on like a camera. Sometimes if you take a photo, you get some noise in it, that little grain. It just gives it that little realistic kind of effect. So these are some vector muzzle flashes. I mean, these were created in Illustrator by some talented individual. They look awesome. They're again, like everything else from Adobe Stock. These were really good actually. They have that black background on them, but as I say before, change your blending mode to screen, lighten one of those, and it just removes the black and keeps the muzzle flash. And they look freaking awesome. They look so good. They're definitely the best muzzle flashes that I've been able to find so far. And there's a pack of multiple ones as well. So I kind of wish I had more, more guns to just use more muzzle flashes, to be honest. Okay, so we're just using some bullets now. I've cut out a few of those bullets and I'm just gonna duplicate those. Command of Control J to duplicate your selected layer. And I'm just moving these down. I'm just going to brush a few away, just kind of make this feel a bit more random. And then I'm just merging these all together and just going to edit, transform and warp, just bending them slightly. So bullets don't really kind of come out of a gun perfectly straight. They sort of tend to follow like an arc, even though they are quite randomized in their position. I would say this like I'm some kind of firearms, firearms expert. I'm not. I'm just I've just played a lot of games in my life. So we've got the bullets. I've added some motion blur to the bullets as well, just because they are coming out of the, the mini gun quite fast. <laughs> this does look a bit weird. Yep, we have him. <laughs> so let's get rid of that. Content aware fill, boom, gone. Amazing, I love this feature in Photoshop. Content aware fill is just genius. It doesn't always work, but even if it doesn't work, it can give you like a massive head start on some retouching. So here I've got this container thing that's completely rusted, whatever it is. It looks like it goes into the ground at the moment, which looked a bit weird. So I'm just kind of trying to work on that a bit more. Of course, we have to get an explosion in there. Same again, it's on a black background. So I can blend this into the background. Probably not as effectively as things like the lens flare and the muzzle flash, but hey, this still works. It's gonna be in the distance, it's gonna be blurred out. So, you know, it's all good. Okay, let's focus back on the subject. So we're gonna add some cracked glass to her goggle things that she's got on her helmet. 
Again, it's on a black background. Change the blending mode to screen or lighten. You can see this technique is something that I use quite a lot. There we go, cracked glass, perfect. And I'm just filling this with white with that soft feather brush again and just masking away some of it, changing the blending mode just to add like a little bit of light coming from the upper right direction. This just helps give it a bit of depth. This kind of didn't really work out in the end. I think I was trying to make it so like one of the one of the lights was active with some kind of sci-fi UI around it, but I called it HoloLens. I think that's a Microsoft product, but whatever. <laughs> this kind of didn't work in the way that I thought it would, um, but this is something that I could have spent a lot more time on. I could have actually created like a holographic UI and had it appearing in front of her face, but I guess I just chose not to in the end. Although I definitely know that in a minute she does get the dramatic lens flare treatment. I just love lens flares. I can't help myself. So you can see we've got quite a few tabs along the top at the moment. We've got smart objects inside of smart objects. This file does get pretty big. In fact, if your Photoshop document exceeds something like two gigabytes, then you won't be able to save it and you will need to switch from a PSD format to a PSB format. And that's just a larger document format. That's usually what most of my files end up being is PSB, just because they're massive. Yep, there we go, dramatic lens flare treatment. Adding a little bit of blur to the lens flare just so it's not perfectly like crisp around the edge. And I feel like we're getting there actually. I think there's a little bit more work to do, but. Okay, so just going around, adding a little bit more shadowing around the gun, the wrist, on the arm. So you can see what I was saying. This isn't a straight line process. It's very backwards and forwards. It's a good idea as well to do like a bunch of work, maybe take a break, have like a break of an hour, two hours, show someone who hasn't been staring at it for as long as you have, get their opinion because they will spot things maybe that you haven't seen. And when you come back to it after a break, you'll definitely see things as well. Like I think this session was recorded over four separate recordings. And after the first two, I took a break, I came back and I made a massive long list of things that I had missed, things I needed to fix. So the third and the fourth session recording this was very much about going back and probably doing a lot of what you're seeing now actually in the later stages, just going and correcting mistakes, things I've noticed, correcting shadows, blah -de blah that kind of thing. And if you get the chance to sleep on it and have a look the next day, then, you know, fantastic. You might wake up and look at it and go, wow, that's fantastic. Or you might think, oh goodness, that's terrible. So yeah, it's good. It's good to take a break. We're just adding a bit more color into that lens. And blending modes are awesome for this kind of work. They just make it much easier to blend different images into other images, blend in colors, highlights, glows, things you add, lighting, whatever it is, just blend that into the image. And I'm just going through and clipping this muzzle flash here. I probably could have just used a few different muzzle flashes to make some kind of variety, but they're all the same model of mech, the same minigun, so they all get the same muzzle flash. And it probably doesn't make sense that a muzzle flash is coming from the, the middle of the gun, but hey look, it looks pretty cool, right? It's, it's blurred in the background. So I'm just blurring those light rays a little bit and then going back, and I think I just drop the background blur a little bit here. I think it goes from eight to six. There we go. Just so the blur isn't as pronounced. I 
Ooh, we're definitely getting near to the end now. I think these are the last few things I'm adding. So we've got a we've got a blood handprint, which isn't actual blood. Hopefully, it's paint. So I've had to match this to the hand that I'm using so that the thumb is in the correct place. Again, that's a little detail that if the thumb was on the other side, it would look weird. So if you need to flip something horizontally or vertically, it's definitely worth doing. And I'm going to use the multiply blend mode. So remember that blends all the lighter colors and the whites into the background, keeps the other colors like the reds. And just making that a little bit more pronounced, brushing a little bit of it away. So she's kind of injured here. She's, she's crawling along the floor or trying to get back up. And we've got a little blood handprint there. And we've also got some here. This wasn't the most ideal uh, sort of blood paint splat thing that I was gonna use, but when you kind of make it small and squish it down, you can see here that this guy, he's clearly been injured. He's kind of trying to back away. He's run out of ammo. And he's left a little bit of a, a blood trail of where he's moved from. So it's something that I said in my last walkthrough video of my other composite is that you're trying to create this scene but you want to also kind of imagine what is happening in this scene imagine it's like a story you know if you make these things more believable and you add all those little details in then it's just going to make your entire scene just feel much more real oh and that yellow thing just really annoyed me so content aware fill and yeah you're gone just saving those smart objects Going back to the main document. Nope, just gonna make a few more changes. So just brushing around a little bit of the bottom, some of this material. I think it was just all looking a little bit too jagged so I kind of wanted to go around some of it myself kind of just to check that it all looked correct and that, that the select subject had done a good job but actually a lot of it down here apart from the boots the boots needed to be a little bit cleaner that I'm going to clean up now but a lot of the other bits are like their jeans they're like rags from the clothes they are a bit roughed up and that kind of made sense for me but the boots they definitely needed to be cleaned up so i've gone around there and just made them a little bit cleaner and just removing a few bits filling in a few bits here that should have been removed but weren't caught in the selection so like i say the select subject feature does like 80 90 percent of the work most of the time and then you just need to go in and just kind of finish it up and that's the beauty of using layer masks so you can add in take away whenever you like nope still not done gonna make a few more changes so you can see here what I'm doing is I'm taking a moment or two just to kind of sit back look at it see what is and what isn't working And this is where I bring the dog eye. Do you remember I mentioned earlier, we bring the dog eye from the main scene because it was being a bit too blurred and I want that to be a bit more pronounced. So I've brought that into the main document so it isn't affected by the blur. And we're putting that in the post effects folder at the top, just giving it a very subtle blur. There we go, two. Nope, still going again. Oh my goodness. So there's, um, there's something else that I've clearly spotted that needs to be changed. I think this is where I go back and I kind of refine the shadow a little bit more on the mech and the dog. So just setting the bl blending mode to multiply, bringing the opacity down and just brushing in that shadow. So this is the shadow for the mech, just extending that out a little bit and actually bringing part of that shadow up the wall as well behind. So by saving and closing, you update that smart object and then it takes you back to the main document with those changes made.
So you can see towards the end when you're fine tuning everything, it's very much a backwards and forwards process. Make some tweaks, go back to the main document, see those changes. How does it all look with the effects applied? Any kind of scene effects like the blur? And I think this was actually one of the last things I worked on was this explosion. The color was just a little bit too bright and a bit punchy. So I'm just kind of duplicating this layer, masking certain areas. And I think I go and mask the bottom as well to try and blend that hard edge. You can see there's kind of a hard edge there behind the feet of the mech in the distance. So I wanted to make the explosion just a little bit darker and just blend certain areas so it's not as white particularly here around the lower left side. And of course, grouping it into its own folder, just masking some of that away. Most of the bottom of the explosion is covered by the subject. But there we go, it looks a little bit more like it sits within the scene and blends a bit more into the background. but apparently not enough. So I'm just gonna brush into it a little bit more. Update that smart object back to the main document. And what I'm doing now is I've actually decided that this is it. I'm not gonna go and change anything else. So I've just gone to uh, select all edit copy merged, copied the entire thing and just added a slight bit of blur to the entire thing overall, just so everything just has a slight bit of softness to it and doesn't look too crisp. And there we go, I think that I'm actually done now. And there we go, that's how I created my new piece of photo art titled Survivor. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, thoughts, feedback, likes, dislikes, whatever it is, please do pop that down below. But as always, like this video if you enjoyed it. Take care and I'll see you next time.